Hi, welcome to the Home Harvest Garden Tour, where I'll be talking about all the awesome fruit trees and berries and vegetables and flowers that we planted here uh, about six years ago. This garden is about six years old. It's a very successful garden, a very beautiful, very magical garden. Right now I'm looking at hummingbirds flying around, beautiful sunset light. We designed and built this garden and this is what subsistence farming looks like in style. Everything emanates from this central patio where you get some beautiful views into the garden and we're celebrating summer solstice 2020. And so yeah, let's get right into it. it starts with this awesome tree right here, a very unique fruit tree called a melon tree. It's kind of like a cross between a fig and a mulberry with these really interesting red fruit that look like little brains about this size. Very sweet. Uh, this is growing right next to the patio. And so we're experimenting with some exotic fruit trees and they've been quite successful here. This right here is a medlar tree. Super unique, unique fruit tree. This tree is about three years old or so. This tree you harvest in December and it has to be exposed to several frosts until it's actually edible. And so this is the last fruit tree, or the last fruit that you'll be harvesting of the whole season. Oftentimes we harvest this fruit, the medlar fruit, uh, when there's snow on the ground after all the leaves have fallen. And so right off with this tour, we've got a shade tree or melon tree and then a medlar tree. Uh, two pretty exotic fruit trees. And then here's a third very exotic fruit tree, a fig tree. So we're growing these figs as kind of like house plants. These are a little bit more difficult to grow because they're not cold hardy in Massachusetts. So we move these into the basement or they overwinter. And then we bring them out uh, for the late spring, kind of like you would with house plants. And you do actually get figs. And so these are kind of peppered throughout this patio deck area. And it's just a fun thing to grow. Up here we've got a sour cherry tree. This tree is loaded with fruit. The birds get a lot, but so do people, which is which is nice. This peach tree right here, loaded with fruit. There's probably three or four hundred peaches on this tree. This tree is maybe only three and a half, four years old. Behind here, it's hard to see, but we've got two pawpaw trees, an apple tree, some raspberries. This is a very abundant garden with edible plants, both annuals and perennials, juxtaposed with flowers. And so, especially with views from the patio, this garden's very attractive. Um, to people who don't know what edible plants look like, this really does look like more of a flower garden, especially when you're sitting around the patio. And that was by design. We've got a lot of flowers incorporated into the edible garden. So here we've got flowers and peonies right next to a blueberry plant and a dogwood. And so the line between edible garden and ornamental garden is blurred and we like it that way. We like it when our, our edible gardens look like flower gardens. That's how this garden was designed. And so moving from this sort of semi orchard, semi flower garden area, we move into more uh, vegetable garden production where we've got perennial onions, but we've also got a lot of annual crops being grown. We're using landscape fabric between the rows to help control the weeds. So we've got carrots, we've got Swiss chard, we've got a lot of kale, we've got peas. This has been a very difficult growing season. It's been a lot colder than usual. And so everything's a few weeks behind here in Western Massachusetts, but overall things are doing quite well. And there is a lot of food that's pretty close to being ready to harvest. And there's already quite a bit of food that's already ready to harvest. Here we've got a nice medicinal herb garden, skullcap, mint, feverfew, valerian root, lemon balm, chives, a lot of really interesting medicinal herbs. And this really just looks like a flower garden. So it's amazing what you can grow in a relatively small space in this one little area. We've got maybe 10 different medicinal herbs all thriving. Here we've got a lot of microgreens. Looks like we've got some tatsoi, some Asian greens, some bok choy, some arugula, some lettuce, 
all growing under this Asian pear fruit tree. So this is one of our favorite fruit trees that we grow here. Very beautiful tree. This tree is about four, four and a half years old. Uh, Asian pears are awesome. They don't get that tall. This is gonna not get too much taller than this. So most of the fruit can be harvested without having to use a ladder. And this, this tree probably has about 200 fruit on it. They're small right now, but they will size up soon. At this size, you actually do want to manually remove most of the fruit because it's, it's just got too much fruit. And you can imagine each of these being the size of a tennis ball. It can actually weigh down the limbs, break branches. And so we want to come through and manually remove some of the fruit. Um, it just shows how abundant this garden is. This tree is laden with fruit. This is a persimmon tree, one of my favorite fruit trees that grows in this area. Native fruit tree, very attractive very easy to grow, low maintenance, disease resistant, just an overall great tree. I highly recommend growing the American persimmon tree. Most people don't like persimmons because they haven't eaten a fully ripe persimmon. They're not very good if they're underripe. So the way you harvest it in the fall is you, you shake the tree and the ripe ones will fall and then you pick the ripe ones up off the ground and they're really tasty. They're very sweet, kind of like a cinnamon apricot kind of flavor. Um, very easy tree to grow. This tree we're keeping it small, we're pruning it to keep it low, but this ki this tree could get 30 feet tall if you don't prune it, or taller. Uh, this tree will also live over 80 years, so hopefully this tree will outlive me and people will be harvesting it every single year. Nice flower garden over here. This is a nice uh, natural structure for growing tomatoes. This is a very unique fruit tree right here. This is the pawpaw tree. I thought this tree was dead. It completely died back to the ground. I assumed it was dead for a year. That's why we planted this other Asian pear here. Now these trees are growing too close together. We need to think about which one is gonna be moved uh, because when I planted this tree, this tree was totally dead. And look, it's, it's come back really nicely. The pawpaw tree is a very unique fruit tree. It's the largest fruit in New England. It, it looks to be about the size of a mango. It looks like a mango. It tastes like a mix between an avocado, banana, pineapple. It's a very unique, complex flavor, and it is native to this area. And so I'm very happy that this tree has come back. We have about five pawpaw trees here in this garden, about six Asian pears, and these plants just kind of take care of themselves. They're pretty low maintenance overall. We've got a row of strawberries right here. These strawberries were just planted this spring, already loaded with fruit. They're doing quite well. This Asian pear is about three years old, laden with fruit. This has about maybe 60, 70 fruit on it. We'll have to thin this quite a bit because it's gonna, it's gonna overproduce. That's one of those good problems. A lot of fruit on this tree. All these trees are grafted, which means that we're selecting the most delicious and disease resistant varieties that grow in this area. We don't spray any of our trees. We generally don't recommend spraying unless it's a, a really bad problem, uh, but we really don't spray any of our trees because we're relying on disease resistance. We're relying on the right microclimate for the right tree, making sure that there's lots of airflow and sunlight so that the drying time is maximized. We don't have a lot of lingering moisture which means less mold, less fungal problems, and a more prolific harvest. So we don't spray any of these trees and we have a lot of success. This is a nectarine tree. This is one of the more difficult trees to grow without spraying. Uh, last year, we didn't get any fruit because of a late spring frost. This year, there is quite a bit of fruit. It's doing quite well. And we are pruning this tree with an open center like we are most of the trees to allow in a lot of light. One thing interesting about this tree and these adjacent trees is that they're absorbing a lot of the nutrients from the adjacent chicken coop. So all of this chicken manure and bedding from this chicken coop is fertilizing all of the adjacent trees. And so you open up this door and the chickens are in here. Very healthy chickens. Hey, buddy. Biodiversity is the name of the game. You want to be growing as many different things as you possibly can. That's what leads to a successful garden. That's what makes your garden more resilient. 
So here we're growing fruit trees, we're growing berries, we're growing vegetables, we're growing herbs, we have chickens, we're growing mushrooms, we're probably growing 50 to 80 different types of edible plants and fungi as well. And that means that if there's a year where it's too rainy or it's too sunny or there's a drought, something always is going to do well, whether it's a difficult season or whether it's raining too much or it's too cold or too hot, too dry, something's always going to do well. So biodiversity is really the best strategy to use. This is a nice Asian pear. This is only maybe, I think it's only two years old and look at how much fruit it has. Just an overwhelming amount of fruit. This is going to size up. This will be ready to harvest in a few months. So the way we're targeting these chickens is via an electric fence. And this electric fence is very much by design as well because it's underneath this peach tree. It's not an accident that this peach tree is so large and prolific. It's because it's being fertilized by all the manure of the chickens and the chickens are giving us eggs, but they're also giving us disease control. They're eating fallen fruit that might otherwise harbor pathogens. They're taking the weeds that would otherwise be a problem and converting that into a useful food source. So we get manure from these chickens, we get eggs from these chickens, we get their scratching up and their weeding from the chickens. Uh, so they're very multifunctional. And as a result of their activity, this peach tree is thriving. If I had to guess, there's at least two to 300 peaches on this one tree. And that's largely due to the fact that these chickens are fertilizing the tree. This is a row of raspberries over here. And these raspberries are really productive. They're very low maintenance. In the late fall or in the early spring, we'll shovel manure from the chicken coop and just throw it right on the raspberries. So everything is full circle. Everything is very holistic. The waste from one element is fuel for another element. So nothing really gets wasted here. All the organic matter gets recycled. And that's another thing that is required for a resilient homestead, something that is more sustainable, something that is more um, self-reliant. We don't need to rely on bringing in as many nutrients from outside the farm. Everything is generated on site or to a larger extent generated on site. Here we've got squash, we've got pumpkins, We've also got a beautiful apple tree. Everywhere you look, there's food growing here. And one interesting thing about this garden, by design, these electric fences to keep critters out, these electric fences to keep the chickens in, these are flexible, these are movable, so that if we need to, we could even get a dump truck right into the back door, just in case we need to get wood delivered or we need to get materials delivered. So we've very strategically place the fruit trees and the chicken coop and the greenhouse and the permanent fixed items so that you can move the temporary items in order to get a truck in here and so everything is accessible where it needs to be here we've got a greenhouse where we can grow year-round we don't heat this greenhouse it's just heated by the sun and we're able to grow greens and herbs year round without any additional heat. Here we've got chives, we've got lots and lots of parsley, and because now it's warmer, we're growing tomatoes, we're growing cucumbers, and this is a great way to extend the growing season. Greenhouses are awesome. Uh, it's, it's a great investment for the more experienced gardener that really wants to extend the season into the winter. And you don't need to heat a greenhouse as long as you're selecting cold hardy greens and herbs. And the way to do that correctly would be starting the greens and herbs in August or September to get a really good head start while there's still sun in the sky. And that will then extend into the winter months with a little bit of extra protection. So we'll put a material called Rime uh, over these crops. It's like an agricultural woven fiber blanket so that we can extend the, the season even further because it gets very cold here at night and things do survive quite well. Here we've got a nice peach tree, again, pruned to a nice open center shape. So there's a lot of airflow. Sunlight is the best fungicide. That's a really good quote that's worth remembering. If you can see through the tree, there's a lot of airflow. There's a lot of 
sunlight, that means that you're going to have less mold, less uh, fewer fungal problems. And so again, we're not spraying any of our trees, so we're, we're relying on sunlight and airflow to prevent the fungal problems. We're not out here spraying copper, we're not out here spraying fungicides, um, we're just not really interested in spraying. If we can do it in other ways that are more sustainable, we're going to try to do it that way. So here, moving this way, beautiful place to sit. Everywhere you look, there's just abundance. There's beans growing up this awesome trellis. There's an apple tree. You've got horseradish growing over there near the fence. We've got a, a beautiful bed of asparagus. This, this is a very prolific bed of asparagus. We're using landscape fabric between the rows to control weeds. We're using um, organic matter around the asparagus to control weeds. Generally what we're doing is we're either planting very densely with flowers or with greens or with herbs and that density will help to keep the weeds to a minimum or we're using mulch, and in this case we're using straw or hay, something that doesn't have a lot of weed seeds in it. We're using wood chips. We're gonna experiment with inoculating these wood chips with mushrooms so even the walkways can be productive. Uh, and we're also using landscape fabric. Landscape fabric is a great way to keep weeds down. If you can see the soil, you're probably gonna have weeds growing. And so you wanna basically cover the soil with as much as possible, whether it's densely planted perennials or whether it's landscape fabric or mulch. We've got lots of perennial onions here. These have been here for years, very prolific. A bed of kale, a few beds of garlic. What's really exciting about this garden in particular is the biodiverse mix of perennial plants and annual plants. And again, it's biodiversity that makes a garden more resilient. The beach plum. There's just edible plants everywhere you look. So we're keeping deer and groundhogs out of this garden using this electric fence. This can be solar powered, this can be plugged into the grid. I don't want to touch it because it's pretty strong, but this little cap right here is filled with apple scent and it will lure the groundhogs or the deer up to this fence, they'll smell it and they'll get zapped on their face and it's not a permanent form of damage, it's just very jarring and they will associate, the, the critters will associate that shock with the fence and then the, the fence will serve more as a psychological barrier keeping critters out and deer can jump over eight feet tall and we're keeping deer out with a fence that's about knee height so it's, it's pretty visually subtle, you kind of see right through it and it's generally very effective. And then there are things that were growing outside of the fence that don't need as much protection. This is a beautiful plum tree, again, pruned with a nice open center. And then we're growing elderberries, we're growing raspberries, we're growing some grapes outside of the fence. And one thing I wanna end the tour with is this very, very cool mushroom garden. So up here, we cut down some oak trees that were already casting shade in the wrong places and we converted that carbon source to food for mushrooms. So using inoculated dowels, we're plugging up these oak logs with shiitake mushrooms and there will be a pretty prolific harvest in the spring. And so something like this, it's a pretty small log. This might only fruit with mushrooms for a year or two, but something like this, this might actually fruit for five to eight years consecutively. And it's a very low maintenance, very passive form of agriculture. Once you do the work, the logs are here and then you just come and you harvest. So everywhere you look in this garden, there's something that you can harvest. And again, one of the things that makes this garden so special is the vast biodiversity. We're growing mushrooms in the shade. We're growing fruit trees. We're growing berries. We're growing medicinal herbs. We're growing culinary herbs. We're growing a vast variety of annuals. And so we're always going to have success in this garden, whether if it's too wet, if it's too dry, if it's too hot, 
if it's too cold, something's gonna succeed and something might not succeed. And that's just part of gardening. Not everything is gonna thrive every single year. And so biodiversity is your best strategy for a resilient garden. And gardens can be very beautiful. They can be very productive. They can be very magical. It's pretty exciting to be sitting on the patio here and watching hummingbirds fly over and eating from the flowers that we just planted. Uh, so we hope you enjoyed this video tour.